Hi, good afternoon uh, for everybody. Uh, I'd like it, uh, to have here with us uh, Professor Gerard Quinn. Raise your hand. <laughs> He's a very good friend of us and also, of course, uh, Professor Peter Blank. Also, he, he told me that uh, He's here after uh, six uh, years of uh, waiting for this uh, moment, uh, and uh, in Israeli time, uh, it's a uh, short time, you tell me. It's a minute in Israeli It's a minute, <laughs> anyway. And I told him that he has a very uh, beautiful uh, photograph in Haifa, because the sun makes him uh, look uh, more handsome than uh, what he is. <laughs> but uh, uh, with us also Professor Ar Krimerman, that uh, everyone uh, knows him here, and uh, of course, uh, we start with the professor first, and Professor Jack Javier, and uh, Dr. Shlomo Yeshar, and Kuti, you have to be a doctor to be a doctor. One minute. <laughs> One minute. <laughs> and of course, Kuti Tzaba, who you all know. Almost all, all the members here are uh, from the, the Ministry of uh, uh, Social Welfare and especially from the Division of uh, Disability, uh, uh, Intellectual Disability, because I, I have now to practice uh, my new, uh, uh, new uh, title, so uh, I presume that everyone knows that I, I am now uh, the head of the Division of uh, Disabilities with uh, the other disabilities. And, uh, we start the new, we start the new area. Administration. Okay, administration, I don't like the, the world, so maybe we'll try to see what, uh, what uh, will be the title. And, uh, and uh, now, today, we, are, uh, we have the honor to uh, hear, to listen to Professor Gerard Quinn and to, uh, to his lecture about his practice in uh, Ireland and overall uh, Europe and overall the world. And I invite you to... Uh, to, to your lecture, please. And thank you for Ma thank you to Mark uh, for his uh, all the arrangements and all the discussions before it. Please. It's a real pleasure to be here again. I see a lot of old friends, which is fantastic. Um, I'm just going to talk about a few things, but basically, I'm going to introduce you to the European policy environment. Most importantly, to just reveal to you how you can find out information, particularly on the issue of personalization and individualization of budgets, and then look at that as a case study. Um, our government, the government of Ireland, has just set up a task force on individualization. So now is a nice time to be talking to you about it because we're just beginning and bringing together all of the information um, and sharing it with Mark and others. Um, so I want to just, this a little bit of heavy lifting there, I want to just give you a bit of backdrop to the arrangements in Europe, which are complicated even to European citizens, but I'll try and make it as accessible as possible. One of the big drivers of change at European level and in our member states is the ratification of the UN Treaty by the European Union, as well as its member states. And we haven't used this to suggest there are answers. What we have used this to do is to create a new policy space, a new politics of disability, and we find our own answers. So it's not as if we're intimidated by an external source. We're actually excited about the new space that it opens up. And it has become a major driver of change and I'll show you how momentarily. And then I'll just open up the whole issue of personalization. I've just been saying to Gideon, we don't have answers, but we're on the same journey, and I'll highlight some of the problematics that we're turning our mind to, that presumably you're turning your mind to, and I'm feeding uh, Mark quite a lot of material uh, on this. Um, so we're all in this together, and it's a very, very interesting journey. What's the backdrop? This is the backdrop. The position in the past was that our member states had all of the legal competence, 
all of the policy competence. Remember, the European Union essentially is an engine for economic integration, not for social integration. So the evolution of social policy at European level has been halting, slow, um, but it has eventually arrived. Um, so the changes happened in the 1990s, um, partly as a result of the inspiration of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And in 1996, the European Commission adopted a famous policy recommendation announcing that not welfare but equal opportunities would be the main departure point for its activities in the future. I was fortunate enough to be involved in drafting that. And then the year afterwards, you equip yourself with legal power to do something about it. So we changed the underlying treaties of the European Union, added and expanded an existing non-discrimination provision, which was then used to generate legislation and new policies and to reorient our funding instruments. EU funding instruments are incredibly important, particularly for poorer member states in Eastern and Southern Europe. And it was that change in the treaties in 1997 that formed the legal basis for the European Union to ratify the UN Treaty. Not competence in a whole range of fields, but just to the window of equal treatment, non-discrimination. Uh, this is the only international human rights treaty the European Union has ever ratified. So a lot of people are looking at it to gain lessons for other spheres and, you know, race and gender and so forth. So that was the backdrop. We ratified in 2010. The Belgians had the presidency of the European Union. A lot of people were saying, hang on, let's wait before we ratify until every member state has ratified. The Belgians said, to hell with that. We're going to go ahead and ratify. Why be held up by the slowest ship in the convoy? And they, it took a lot of political courage to do that, but that's what they decided to do. Um, ratification of the UN Treaty doesn't suddenly mean that the European Union is competent in all areas covered by the treaty. For example, there's very little legal competence in the area of education, even though there's a lot of activities in education, and can't legislate on education and so forth. Article 44 of the treaty allows a regional integration organization that's code word for only one organization in the world, namely the European Union, to ratify the treaty, provided it lodges um, a declaration of competence um, to say this is what we're competent for and this is what the member states are competent for. That declaration of competence is being expanded at the moment. Uh, it's quite a difficult document to read and I won't bore you with the details. But the important point about it is the Declaration of Competence in 2010 includes many, 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 many things, but it says the European Union is competent with respect to independent living and social inclusion, as well as working employment, etc., etc., and our funding instruments. And we've had major success in changing the funding instruments. Uh, I'll give you a little open parenthesis. Hundreds of millions of euros were used in the past to open up institutions for people with disabilities, particularly in Poland, as well as in Hungary and the Czech Republic. And upon ratification, there was a big battle to change the funding instruments so that not a dime, not one cent in the future is spent either opening an institution or even refurbishing an, inst uh, an existing institution. So that's pretty important for us. Maybe a little arcane, but I thought I'd just mention it. The EU roles are legislation is the last, right? We, we, a theory of subsidiarity means the U European Union hesitates long before it legislates. And in some of the more important areas, unanimity is needed as between the member states. For example, at the moment, there's a big battle to expand our equality legislation to cover sexual orientation, etc., in fields other than employment. Poland is blocking that. Uh, and Germany is blocking it, and the UK are blocking it. So it's unlikely that we'll have that legislation. So a lot of groundwork has to be done before the European Union ever gets to legislating on a topic. So the rules are to assist the member states. 
they're the guys who still have the vast majority of the competences, but the European Union adds value to their cognitive activities by <coughs> providing the studies, the cost-effectiveness plans, and so on and so forth. Secondly, the European Union provides a platform for you guys, for the member states, for senior civil servants from all capitals to meet each other four times a year to talk out how are we going to deal with personalization and individualization. It's an absolutely fascinating forum. Civil society now has equal rights of audience and participation in that EU high-level group. Um, I'll talk about our funding instruments and legislation comes last. So I hope I'm not boring you by <laughs> giving you these ABCs. What are the sources of information? This is important from your point of view because this is what we need to use as a window to access the knowledge and learn from the experience. Um, there's at least four official sources of information I want to highlight for you. There's more, but these are the important ones. I'll talk about the service providers and why you should be looking at them. I was telling Mark yesterday I discovered a new network of service providers at European level that I should have known about but have only come into contact with very recently. And then civil society. Um, the first is the high level group. They've been meeting at least since the mid-90s. They've eight, I think, eight very, very prominent reports um, on it's interesting, this, the, how it's arranged is that part one of each report is about what's happening at European Union level. So if you want a quick praise of recent developments, this is what you look to. Part two is what's happening at member state level, state by state, okay? And then part three is usually a thematic focus. The thematic focus last year was the role of civil society in partnership with government, in co-production mode with government in developing disability policy and legislation. So the high level group is really fascinating. You probably, if you want to, can attend the high level group. Um, you just have to approach the European Commission and I'm sure that can be arranged. Um, the other source of information is what's called the Academic Network of Experts in Disability. Um, basically, the European Commission funds this it's in all of the member states. We are actually the correspondent for Ireland. And they basically provide research to advise the European Commission. So there's a series of research issues. And then sometimes the Commission says, oh, we have an urgent problem with personalization. Can you do a study on that? And they will do it. So I just gave you one of the pages there, for example, on independent living. There's a number of studies done. And you can search by country. So if you want to find out what's happening in Cyprus, you just get a cheap flight to Cyprus, sorry, yeah. to, or Denmark, or Estonia, or whatever. Okay? Very, very useful. Somewhat out of date, because it's kind of a backlog. It's currently chaired by Professor Anna Lawson in Leeds University, whom some of you will know or have read her stuff. She's just an amazing person. So Anna is your second port of call. Um, third port of call, and I'm actually on the advisory board of this in Vienna, is the European Fundamental Rights Agency. Now, they advise the European Union and its member states in implementing laws and policies as it affects civil rights, okay? Uh, so it's kind of a, what we call a technical agency of the European Union, headquartered in Vienna. Um, they have a number of thematic focal focuses one happens to be on the rights of people with disabilities. So, for example, I just gave you part of the page from the EU FRA on independent living. They have a number of reports, very, very substantive reports down the end of this page. If you scroll down, I can't scroll down. <laughs> and very importantly, they've developed a very sophisticated indicator set on transition to community living. And I flash forward here. One essential part of those indicators is individualization and personalization of services. In other words, the, the EU FRA views individualization and personalization as a core integral element of successful transition into the community. And you can read the indicator set for yourself. I actually have a copy in my bag <laughs> there, but you can look it up on the web. By the way, they have a huge 5 million euro project 
going on at the moment on community living. And the project isn't about the theory of community living and personalization. The project is about the blockages that countries encounter, either administratively or financially, or in terms of financial accountability, and innovative ways of wiring around those blockages. Very, very interesting lady in EU Frau is handling that. She's from England. Um, I can give you her email address later if anybody wants to follow up. <coughs> so another source of information, oh, I should explain this. Every time the European Commission, European Union legislates a major piece of legislation, because they're guardians of the treaties and they have to enforce that legislation and they have limited staff and limited knowledge, they always set up an expert network of lawyers sometimes public policy people, uh, to advise it about the situation on the ground with respect to enforcement and implementation. So the equality directives led to the creation of the European Equality Law Network, uh, fully funded by the European Commission. All its work product is owned by the European Commission, but its website is quite interesting. So when you go into it and you search thematically, you'll find a lot of stuff in equality, community living, um, and related issues. Uh, so I just thought I'd flag that to you. These are the main sources of information that you can go to, and they're relatively easy to, um, to navigate. The major civil society group in Europe, or, or rather the <coughs> umbrella board, is what's called the European Disability Forum in, in Brussels. Um, and that's actually been the inspiration for the setting up of the African Disability Forum. Many of you will know that now there is a disability forum in Africa of NGOs, DPOs, uh, but it's modeled on the European Disability Forum. When you go onto their website, you'll find a lot of stuff on personalization, a lot of stuff on community living from their point of view. Obviously, it's from an advocate's point of view, but it's quite fascinating nonetheless. Uh, I'm reaching the end of this section, please don't worry. Um, we we have good friends in the European Association of Service Providers. This is, of course, not an official source of knowledge, but it, it gives you the story from the service provider's point of view. These are amazing people in Brussels. Uh, Gideon met them, uh, Ari met them, and um, when you go onto their website, what they really are talking about is new business models for service providers and how they endorse that and then as it were, provide technical training for their members scattered right around the European Union on how they can su successfully transition into a different policy environment um, with different business models. So contrary to perhaps your original expectation, service providers are hungry for this transition at European Union level, although some ships in the convoy are slower than others. If I might be permitted to say France is probably the slowest, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, Okay, what else? This is the one I've only recently discovered. Oh, sorry, no, this is from a family point of view. This is where you get the most information at European Union level about family organizations and their perspective on disability issues and inclusion Europe. Hand on heart, um, I think inclusion Europe and inclusion international uh, are saying pretty much the same thing but it's really interesting to go to Inclusion Europe's website to get the perspective of families on change. It's kind of like the equivalent of Akeem here in your country. Um, right. The UN, um, I just want to say a little bit about this. Uh, it's quite fascinating because you've ratified the treaty, the EU has ratified the treaty. Shock, horror, my country actually hasn't <laughs> ratified the treaty, but that's because we had to wait to legislate away guardianship and to put in place supported decision-making legislation, which was enacted by our good friend, Minister Kathleen Lynch, about a year and a half ago now. So what's the difference? The difference is night and day. Um, and it's not so much on substance, although that matters, like new laws, new education laws, new independent living laws. The difference is process. The landscape has been utterly transformed by the ratification of the treaty. It's given a lot more space for public servants to imagine things differently, 
and to have permission to imagine things differently. It's given a lot more space for what we call a new politics of disability, notions of co-production uh, with civil society in major initiatives. And it's put in place a new institutional architecture for change. Pretty much every ministry in Europe is changing just like yours is. Um, pretty much every country has their own mechanism now for monitoring implementation and for driving the process of change forward. That's the important stuff. The process is the important stuff. Why change the episodic bad law when you just reverse to pra revert to practice and put in place new bad laws? If you change the actual process, you're actually putting in place groundwork for a different regime into the future. Um, what's happening in terms of substance is most countries in Europe are engaged in reviews of their own laws. Um, they're trying to work out the premises or the entailments of new first premises. But it's okay to say we've shifted from one set of ideas to another, but working it out in practice takes a heck of a lot of work, a heck of a lot of time. Um, and that's basically where everybody is at the moment. And of course, service providers, particularly at European Union level, are hungry for new business models, hungry to change. Uh, and that's a very good sign for the future. We had the chair of the European Association here in Haifa a year and a half ago, and he gave a most magnificent talk exactly on that topic. Um, if you go back to the EU FRA, remember I mentioned the European <coughs> Union Fundamental Rights Agency? They actually have a paper, it's two years ago, um, on tracking the actual impact of the ratification of the treaty across Europe in the member states and at the European Union level. It's only about four or five pages, so I tell students it's only four or five pages, you can read it. <laughs> and it's an absolutely fascinating document. One of the interesting things it, it reveals is that before ratification of the convention, only three European Union member states had national action plans on disability. Now all of them do. I'm not saying they're all good, <laughs> they're all implemented as designed, but it really has shifted the landscape quite considerably. And the EU FRA paper gives you the hyperlinks to all of these national action plans. And they update this, this list uh, periodically. Um, so, OK, and I'm hitting the, the crescendo here. The issue of personalization. Uh, really, really interesting. I talked about shifting from one value base to another. Uh, we're really in the middle of a transition of doing that. So the old value base was to, not in so many words, but in practice, to view the individual as an object around which things could be managed and controlled, and to design services for needs. That kind of language is slowly exiting the stage, right? Um, it, the way we contrast it now is um, social citizenship as distinct of, from services directly meeting needs. And of course, no social capital was probably the lived experience of many people, with particularly intellectual disabilities, in institutional settings. The thing about this value set is we've built a whole series of institutions, institution practices, expectations on top of them. That is not easy to change. Very, very difficult. The new value base is quite different. We're looking at the individual as a subject with decision-making autonomy. I mean, these are just fancy words of saying exactly the same thing. We're centering the person in as much as that is possible. We're looking at services no longer just to meet needs. Of course, needs always exist. But we're looking at services to do something quite different, which is to bridge people into the community, generate social capital, and underpin the autonomy of the person. And we're embedding the person in the community in order to grow social capital. Very, very interesting publication everybody should read. Unfortunately, it's 200 pages long. The World Bank, about a year and a half ago, produced its annual report on mind and society. And one of the really interesting things the World Bank report does in its report is to say that you think automatically most of the time. You don't think deliberatively. You think socially. For the remainder of the time, you're, you're, as it were, mimicking the actions of your social group. And you also think in terms of inherited mental models. 
So the idea then is of shared personhood, that we don't experience our personhood in extreme isolation, you know, like, like the American Minuteman with his rifle, right, ready to go. Um, it's not like that. It's more that it's the social self that's really important here. And embedding a person in the social environment, there's an interesting dialectic going on between the individuation of the self as well as the social self evolving over time. So, so what we're looking at, therefore, is building something completely different than what existed in the past. We're building moral agency. We're restoring moral agency to the individual. You guys in the Knesset have passed the relevant legislation on assisted decision making. We're building new business models for services. Not easily done, but there is an appetite to do it. Um, we're creating space for public policy makers for innovation, and you will get things wrong, and you have to feel you have permission to get things wrong, and we're leading to social change. Because the more you embed people in the community, the more acceptance there is through time of difference in the community, which is a mutually reinforcing cycle. That's the rhetoric. Getting there is the hard part. And that's why studies like the EU FRA study on um, on the blockages and how they can be innovatively tackled is extremely interesting and relevant. Um, I just, so this is a carpet here. It's all woven of the same cloth. You shouldn't view it as just a technical exercise at the edge, disconnected from other things. What's connected is notions of personhood, notions of voice, control, choice in one's own life, in as much as any of us have it, right? I just keep saying to my students every time I'm in the supermarket and I'm tempted to go to uh, go back and say, my wife wouldn't like that. Because <laughs> I'm always internalizing uh, what she would think. You know? um, so we're never wholly atomistically separate from one another, even though we like to think we are sometimes. Shared personhood is very important in terms of community living. And that's really what we're getting at. And the last one is re-engineering services. So it's a logical to give a person moral agency, choice, and control, unless they have something over which to have choice and control. It just doesn't make sense. Um, Article 12 and 19 contemplated, but actually that's irrelevant. You shouldn't be doing the right thing just because the law tells you to do the right thing. You should be doing the right thing because you want to do the right thing. And you do it your own way. You don't have to follow <coughs> anybody else's model. It's a, absolutely a culturally sensitive thing. So the big challenge is move away from services designed for needs, or exclusively for needs, to services designed to sustain and enhance individual autonomy and social indebtedness. Hence, personalization. Um, I'm using the term personalization rather than individualization, but they're pretty much the same. Here's one of your big dilemmas. Here's one of our big dilemmas, right? Um, well, just before we get to that, in terms of service delivery models, we have the state directly providing services. We have the usual model which you share with much of Europe, which is the state devolves to service providers, the resources with which to actually provide services to the individual, happy individual down here. Here's the new model. The state devolves consuming power to the person who holds the moral agency. And that person then designs their own services, perhaps issues their own preferences and so forth. So with support, because a lot of people can't do this. I mean, one of the biases in a lot of the pilot projects around Europe at the moment is the support isn't put in place. What does that mean? It means it suits only upper middle class people who have the capacity to actually do the financial reporting and so forth. We know this personally in my own family. Um, and it generates a new kind of marketplace for brokers, people who can bridge supply and demand, people whose job it is to be knowledgeable about the services that exist out there, orthodox and unorthodox. Right? So that's why I put plus, 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 the potentiality of the marketplace expanding beyond traditional service providers, since the job of service provision has changed. What are the problems? Um, one problem, one big problem is financial accountability, right? So you want to innovate, you want to do the right thing, but your finance ministry is breathing over your neck. I know that, because we have this in Ireland too, right? Um, 
it is taxpayers' money. There is going to have to be some mechanism of accountability for how it's used. Um, the interesting thing, though, is, and this is the, the kind of fork in the road, do we hold people accountable according to quote-unquote assessed need, right? And that's very convenient, and it's quite easy, and arguably it comes from a medical model of disability. Um, do we say you were to spend 100 euros on X, and you've spent 110 bad boy? Or what if they've spent 100 euros on something entirely different that's not contemplated by traditional mechanisms of assessment of need? Okay? Um, bearing in mind now, what's really important to me may be of no interest to you whatsoever and may not even register on a traditional assessment of need uh, too. Okay? Another issue is, what's the right balance between autonomy and control with accountability? Uh, our government is saying we want light touch accountability, but working that out in practice with the civil servants who are going to have to regulate this is extremely difficult. Um, okay, that's the first problem, financial accountability. Another problem is controlling costs. Because there's always a fear, particularly in the finance ministry, if you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. Right? We have that expression in English. Um, you, uh, and even if you're not logically doing that, they will begin to advocate for more and more and more. Whereas one of the things about uh, direct provision was to just have a finite budget and just hand it over to the individual to handle it with support. Uh, that, that's a possibility. I've seen it before. <laughs> uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but here's where some of the American innovations, the Canadian innovations, even the English innovations on wealth accumulation strategies could ne neatly complement um, the individualization of budgets. I might get Peter to say something about that in a moment, but the essential idea is you create special trust funds into which third parties invest. It might be a mom and pop shop in the corner. It might be a large multinational corporation. And the individual is allowed to use the capital assets coming out of that. By the way, the investors get tax exemptions. So the state is not paying for it, but the state is foregoing some tax income. Not a huge amount, but some. And then the individual is allowed to use the asset up to a certain amount. It's rather high, it's like sixty or seventy thousand dollars. On what he or she wants. Not on assessment of needs and not in very narrow categories. Well actually it differs somewhat from state to state and across the world. But that's the basic idea. So when your finance minister says, no way, this is going to steamroll out of control, you say, are there, way, are there ways of complementing this to cabin yeah, its financial or potential financial impact? Um, how do you know when you succeed? Uh, so there's various different measures out there about how do we evaluate uh, control for success. Are you measuring autonomy, growth in confidence and competence? what we call the evolution of social citizenship. Is that really what's at stake here? Um, are you looking at gains in terms of personal identity? Even gains in terms of personal responsibility. I might have been assessed in the past to require 150 hours of X, but I may not have actually needed it. I may have kept it because of fear that if I get it back, and I had a genuine issue in the future, I'd never get it back, right? So perhaps there could be gains in the future of people more narrowly tailoring what they need, which might have some benefits for the state in terms of financial sustainability. By the way, a lot of the comparative literature now is on financial sustainability of um, personalization and individualization. Are you looking at the broader social impact of personalization? People who are now newly <coughs> confident, competent in as much as any of us are, and the ripple effect in your society in generating much more acceptance and openness um, and even warmth toward the presence of people with disabilities just like us. Actually, I should have called this talk just like us. Um, so there, these are, we have no answers to these problems, by the way. Um, here's another problem, and it's very ideological. It has to do with your conception of the marketplace. It's all very well to say we're shifting to a kind of a market-based approach 
for the delivery of services, but there are actually competing conceptions of the market and competing philosophies of market failure warranting the state to intrude. Here's the iron lady down here. And one of the fears is that personalization, individualization is but a short hop and step toward the neoliberal state privatizing all social resources and assets. Um, and that's a possibility. Some people argue very passionately to generate an open-ended market, allow any Tom, Dick, or Harry to put themselves as, as providing services, and then just let the consumer choose. That's how a market functions, right? Problem with that um, is that you'll have market entrants who will periodically go bankrupt, and you'll have a lot of people dependent on them, and then you have a real problem for the state that has to pick up the pieces. This has happened in England only two or three years ago, when a huge provider for services for older people declared bankruptcy, and I think it was Yorkshire who was left pulling the bill. The other way is to regulate the market. You have some baseline requirements. You don't allow every Tom, Dick, and Harry into the marketplace. They must exceed some baseline requirements, perhaps the most important of which is capital reserve, <laughs> so they can actually continue to function. Uh, and you hedge against market failure. This is Robert Reich, Clinton's kind of market intervention person. And the, the third approach is to regulate the market and go a bit further. Um, to have old and new service providers entering and to actively invite new service providers into that market. And by the way, it's not a service provider per geographic location, because if you're in a geographic location and you're confined to one provider, what's the point of giving people choice and control or even legal capacity? It just doesn't make any sense. Uh, do you nudge those service providers toward different business models? How are you going to support them? Um, and that's why the European Union um, Association of Service Providers is so interesting. Um, you grow a new kind of business of brokerage to, as it were, bridge supply and demand, because people will not be knowledgeable or fully knowledgeable about the options, but brokers perhaps can acquire that information and with, with mutual profit pass it on. This is what's happening in a lot of European countries at the moment. Some business providers are shutting up shop and they're just becoming brokers. Um, so their capital, so to speak, is their knowledge and their information about the environment, and then connecting the person to the most appropriate service that can be provided. <coughs> um, I'll just show you this. This is a, a report from last year, 2016. Um, it's from our Health Research Board in association with other uh, agencies in the country. 148 page report on individualized budgeting. It goes to international approaches and the evidence on financial sustainability. I always have to have the financial sustainability element in there, otherwise the finance ministry will veto anything you do. It's probably the single best source of comparative knowledge at the moment, and what's happening in several countries around the moment, and it's, it's really, really uh, well done, even though it's from my own country, as I say myself. Um, so, yeah, this is just a page from that report, and it shows you different ways in different countries of conceptualizing direct payments and individualized services. So they're not all coming at it with one unified philosophical concept. It's actually quite different, uh, and that just gives you a sense of, um, of what the report actually does. So it's really, really worth, well worth having a look at. This is the new agency that I've discovered. I keep discovering things in Europe. It's so complicated for European citizens to figure out what's going on. This is a group called European Platform for Rehabilitation. Very, very interesting group. And they are actually passionate about personal budgets too. You'd imagine they would be like a turkey voting for Christmas because their market is going to change very, very significantly. But they see the writing on the wall. They're preparing to change their business models. And if you scroll down to some very useful studies and reports done by these service providers, which is absolutely quite fascinating, uh, including on personalized budgets. Um, if anybody is visiting Brussels, I'd suggest to go to them, 
some of the European Commission agencies and the European Association of Service Providers as well. Um, just tell you a very brief bit about what's happening in Ireland at the moment. Uh, we have had coalition governments for at least the last 25 years. And one of the nice things about coalition governments is there's complicated negotiations before the government gets up and running. And backbenchers have disproportionate power in those negotiations. And one of the backbenchers decided to advance this idea of not thinking about it, but finding out how to do it, how to implement it. So the terms of reference of the government task force is how to introduce individualized um, and personalized services in the country. Um, it's building on our competition authority report of a few years ago that revealed utterly uncompetitive practices as between and among uh, service providers, and um, basically how the taxpayer is getting fleeced. Uh, now, you could flip that one way to say, let's just have an open marketplace, right? Or you could flip it the other way to say, let's have a regulated marketplace, and that is essentially the way the government is flipping it, okay? So this was shocking. The amount of money being spent and wasted was absolutely shocking. So people realized something quite different was needed. There's also been several value for money reports and disability services. Value for money is a technical term, which the accountants among you will know about. But they, they showed, first of all, how the amount of money being spent in the different areas vary tremendously, even though the condition is exactly the same. And it also showed that um, keeping people in institutions costs the state on an annual basis at least 150,000 euros. That's a lot of money, right? Um, there's been a lot of pilot projects around the country, mostly based on pilot projects in Australia. Uh, some really, really excellent stuff coming out of Australia at the moment. And also we had a famous report, 2007, 2008, on ending congregated settings. In other words, closing down institutions and closing down many institutions. And the government decided it would fit well with this if, in fact, we had this task force. So I'm actually sitting on the task force at the moment. We're just beginning to gather all the literature together, which I will certainly pass on to Mark and others. And uh, that just gives you a sense of what's in, happening in Ireland. There's my local village. Um, some about five pubs and one church, and I think we got the ratio just about right there. Uh, so please come visit any time. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, when we talk about personal budgeting, uh, it can be kind of a very competitive market uh, where you know uh, services are being uh, challenged by uh, families, by individuals. This is one model. It can be a regulated model. That uh, the government decide about nets, about what we call vouchers, to be controlled. Where is Europe into this dilemma between the regulated market and competitive? I know that Mark, we talked about a lot of it, visited Finland that had just uh, 2014 legislation and very different from Scandinavia, they are moving more toward the kind of competitive market uh, with analysis. And uh, I know that the UK is uh, very much regulated local market. So where is your opinion? I have maybe a complimentary question. Um, when we are talking about virtues of any kind of bad thing, is the government supposed to pay for outcomes? I mean, what for change in the situation of the client, of the person with disabilities, or either are we going to pay for services, for outputs? Great question. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I think the trend is, there's a group called In, in Control in England. In, in, in Control. control. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's like a social innovator that tries to model out different ways of doing business. And one of the most recent reports is called um, A Life, Not a Service. Um, so even service language is kind of been pushed to one side. But the better is, is the, I mean, the question, whether it's regulated or unregulated or something in between, that's for you to decide. That's for your own culture. I, I personally think it's really unsafe to have an open-ended kind of neoliberal market for all kinds of services and then services that we wouldn't even categorize as services. No? <laughs> okay. Um, but, you know, some people with disabilities fear that this is part of a larger neoliberal agenda to basically privatize everything, uh, to make a lot of offers to people, and then set and forget, provide them with a particular quantum of resources, and then just step back. Um, I think that's probably a recipe for disaster because you can see market failure creeping in there easily. The, the only question is how do you regulate? Um, do you want to regulate an existing market? And here's the difficulty with the language of assessed needs, right? We use the language of assessed needs to work out in our own head a quantum of resources that should be allocated to the person. But in fact, what we're trying to do is something quite different. We're trying to give the person latitude and discretion even beyond those assessed needs to meet their own life circumstances as they see them. Then what do you measure for? Do you measure for outcomes? But are you predetermining what the outcomes should be for the individual? Or does the individual live, and this is the language used, his or her own good life, uh, which may or may not dovetail with outcomes that you've preordained as being good outcomes for the individual? Uh, no answers. <laughs> Each country is doing something different according to their own culture and genius. Uh, and, and are you saying so you once? Mean that are mainly moral and political issues more than professional? Yeah, I think they are. I think it really depends on your culture and how you want to shift your culture or do you want to shift your culture. Um, you know, France, for example, is really traditional. And <laughs> I don't see them moving toward this very quickly. Um, Netherlands has. Uh, Flanders in Belgium has. Uh, England has. Scotland has. Ireland's about to do so. And everybody is talking about it, but as yet, only those countries have legislated for the policies in place. I would say that the most important piece is not only political or professional. It's a question of where we are heading. If we're heading toward personal services, like in medicine, if we are ishit, okay, we are moving toward medical, personal medical services. Yeah. So this is really the direction. The question is, how do you ensure the person is going to do better? Because when you regulate and you fit, you know, the person to a program, yeah. like we have today, yeah. uh, there's a possibility that the program will serve people. There's a shelter, okay? Mm -hmm. That people are accommodated to a program. However, it's not a personal choice. It's, it's, it's a default, you know? You belong here, or you belong there, or you don't belong, okay? So the question is, I think, is how Israel is going to move. Definitely, we need to move to personal services. The world is moving, the, the convention is moving. It's obvious that, uh, by the way, our law uh, the guardianship law is moving toward the person, personal choices. The question is, what's the right transition? Yeah. And, uh, it has to be done. And the social yeah. model of the mid 20th century, the welfare state, <coughs> whereby the state meets the needs Probably. of the citizens by providing resources, particularly through intermediaries like service providers, <coughs> that's in transition. That's changing. And for example, in England, um, personalization of resources and budgets is now being done for older people as well as for people with disabilities. They, all, they also, if you correct me, they also personal planning. Yes. It's, yeah. Which is, we don't have it. And on the basis of co-production with the individual. 
not just professions around the individual, but the individual's voice you know, graduates. So it means that instead, that part of the cost is, is personal planning. Mm -hmm. How to plan with you the service, not to dump you or let you choose and being stuck by providers. Yeah. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit more about the steps of the transition, uh, the transitional period of passing from services to uh, uh, personal planning or personal budget? Because we cannot, me as a provide, as as somebody of, of in the government, I don't see in my mind what are the the, the, the steps that we have to do uh, to get to the to this uh, kind of uh, giving the. the well, first, first of all, it may not be the choice of everybody to opt into individualized budget. Um, some people have that option and are actually not exercising it at the moment, creating dilemmas for government. How do you keep one system alive whilst investing in a completely different system at the same time? And that's why one of the findings of the EU FRA studies is there's going to have to be um, an element of double funding for a transitionary period to enable people to become comfortable with moving to something else. The brokerage systems, I think, are very important, but they're not there yet. Could and you just say what you mean by brokerage? brokerage. Yeah. So, so this would be a person you would engage in, and it would be, it would be in your budget to hire a broker. Oh, the, the mediator. Exactly. Who's, uh, whose job it is is to know what's out there in terms of services, whether traditional or non-traditional, to know the person intimately, um, and can be part of the person-centered planning, but on the basis of co-production with the person, and then to exercise best judgment as to what service would actually really meet the needs of the individual. The brokerage model, I think it was pioneered in Canada, in British Columbia, isn't that basically a job of social worker with this kind of totality? I mean, that's what they do, isn't it? To help people to make good decisions on behalf of them. It's not, 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 not my experience. Okay, but maybe I, I think that in Israel there is yeah. 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 well, it's useful. Use that purpose. That's what they do. Well, if it's fit for purpose, use it. In some cases, you are. That's why I have to say, I believe that we, knowing the UK and Israel, I believe we are closer to the UK model. Yeah. Because they move from program oriented. From to what? They move from a program oriented, like we had very similar program to the UK 20 years ago. They move to local planning and budgeting. So you cannot differentiate between the planning and budgeting. It's one package deal. And it has to be at the local level. Take, for example, Fox the Wood. It runs locally. <coughs> by the people, and it's adjusted, you know, the... Hmm. You, you <coughs> need supports for families as well to make mm -hmm. this work. Um, and one of the other interesting findings from the FRAS studies is the transaction costs are not accounted for. So there's a lot of transaction costs within families um, in terms of circles of supports, and the actual financial accounting takes no account of the upheaval. Could you just clarify maybe mm -hmm. just the also the English word? When you say transaction costs and families, what do you have in mind? I'll give you my, my situation. Our daughter has an individualized budget. Um, it's not yet law or policy, but providers and commissioners of services around the country are innovating with it. Right? You're the experiment. <laughs> yeah, exactly, the guinea pigs. And my wife happens to be highly trained in mathematics, accountancy, and so forth. And the transaction costs of engaging in reporting back financially are very oh, high. Okay, sure. Very high. And unless you've actually got the supports to take that off the table, it means really only upper middle class families can benefit from this. As things stand. But we're going to change that. <coughs> can I follow up on that? Yes, yeah, sure. Has anybody dealt with that issue? I mean, in where it is being implemented, have they also reached lower classes, and how are they mm -hmm. dealing with that transition issue and reporting requirements? Well, the key thing is to have access to the brokerage, because that's where the knowledge is. The role the right. broker. So what the trend is that a budget is being put into personalized budgets to effectively engage with those brokerage services mm -hmm. as a way of trying to mitigate the transaction right. costs. Because otherwise, they're huge on families. Do you have a special 
training for the brokerages? I don't know. Um, there's a lot of, yeah. It's very, it's very cultural. It's not one, uh, not one for all. It's a very cultural issue. Yeah, the, um, if I go back for a second. Yeah. These guys, uh, the European Platform for Rehabilitation, have what they call a quality standard for services who move to different models, and they do training for service providers right around Europe. That's the only one I know of. You'll find a lot of pilot projects um, that train up new brokerage systems, but they're very scattered and ad hoc. I wanted to ask another question. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, you gave some examples of outcome variables. Um, you didn't mention uh, maybe what we more traditionally think about is the well-being, the sense of well-being of the individual, his overall life satisfaction or, or even satisfaction with the support he gets. And I was just wondering why. The right to make mistakes, um. for example. Well, no, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't intentionally exclude that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. No, I think the big contrast is between conceptualizing services for needs that are easily quantifiable and assessed, or conceptualizing services for social citizenship, which of course must meet needs, but it's doing something beyond that. Okay. Yeah. So and that's where we're just being beyond the kinds of things that. That I mentioned. Yeah, okay. yeah. Well-being would obviously be one of the outcome indicators. Mark. Oh, God, he's the expert. <laughs> no, 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 just a question about the eligibility thresholds for uh, national security services, pensions, and services, social services. Because in, in the, some countries, it's very different systems in many countries. Would you say national security, you national mean security. social security? Social security. Social security pensions and the social services because there's two different apparatus. It really depends on the country. Yes, and in many countries it's very different because you have just this eligibility for pensions, but you don't have eligibility for social services. Yeah. We, we say there isn't the one European social model is 28. <laughs> uh, really varies. What do you think about it? Is, it? is it important, not so important, it's, you know, it's two, two different uh, models? Yeah. Uh, the realist in me would say be pragmatic and don't try and bite off too much before you can choose. Okay. And look at services that you think are essential to the new philosophy of social citizenship and begin with that. That would be my. I mean, one of the tensions is, the de and we have a fight about this in the task force. Not a fight, that's a bad way of putting it. Um, our, what about eligibility for these programs? Does eligibility map over into eligibility on the basis of assessed needs, which is the much more traditional way of looking at things? Or do we just say, regardless of how a quantum is fixed, funds to be devolved to the individual. Every individual has eligibility to draw down those funds. Um, I'll, I'll translate that for you, okay? Um, Social Affairs Ministry is saying 20% of its disability budget is available for personalization. Mm -hmm. The rest is tied up in salaries, very expensive salaries for traditional service providers. Mm -hmm. And there doesn't seem to be a way of Ending that, we don't have the American philosophy of employment at will and just <laughs> uh, sack everybody, right? So it's causing a dilemma for government. Yeah. It's causing a dilemma for government about, well, if we're really serious about restoring voice and choice, we've got to be serious not just on the demand side, but also on the supply side. And we've got to be saying to services, five years to change your business model, otherwise you can't compete for business from the state. And, and if that means structured layoffs over time, well and good. Okay? But that's a political thorn. <laughs> that's really hard for the government. It's a budgetary issue. Yeah, budgetary, but also legal. Because people have vested rights. Since you raised the American <laughs> he meant before Trump. The two words, Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Donald 
Donald Trump wants to cut $1 trillion for services for people with disabilities over the next 10 years. In repealing Obamacare, the Affordable Health Care Act, one of the major provisions of Obamacare was a provision called the money follows the person, which was introduced by Tom Harkin. So for example, under the money follows the person, Medicaid, which is our health care, would pay the first year totally for personal services for people transitioning out of the institution. That's going away. Uh, it's going to be really a cliff that we will fall off for people with disabilities in the United States. Uh, the second big piece of repealing Obamacare will be related to what you're talking about, managed care and um, what we call Medicaid block grants. So instead of personalized money flowing through Medicaid, each state of the United States will get a lump of money and the state will decide how it's spent for people with disabilities. So there'll be terrific inconsistencies. So we are no longer the model to look at. Already, the last thing, already Trump's been in office for 40 days. There are three bills pending, three laws pending passage in the uh, Congress to, to narrow Americans with Disabilities Act. Education. education is another story. The Secretary of Education, this woman who is a billionaire, mm -hmm. yes. she wants to basically privatize the educational system yeah. and have vouchers like we talked Except about. If you it's not a Trump, it's a Trump. It's, a it's, it's privatization on steroids, mm -hmm. right? Because one of the implications, apparently, and this shows the danger of privatization, is that if you take your voucher as a kid with a disability and you present it to a private school, one of the conditions of taking the voucher is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act doesn't apply. So you, the extent to which you get accommodation depends on your purchase power in the private system. It doesn't depend on... I'll tell you one other story. My father, may he rest in peace, was dying. His young lawyer said he liked my father so much that he's not going to charge him for his services. The name of our lawyer, David Friedman, who's going to be the next ambassador to Israel. David Friedman's father was a famous rabbi in the United States. I know him, I email with him, but now he's very uh, aggressive in terms of his views for Israel. So be ready for uh, <laughs> taking the American embassy to Jerusalem. <laughs> He was a bench to my family, but we'll see what happens with American ambassadors. So, so I'm, I'm feeding a lot of material to Mark, and I'm sure you can share it with people. Thank you. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much.